Okay, as you all know, it's just Alan and I here today because you couldn't be here because we're told that we're not supposed to have big crowds. And uh, so this is a new thing for us. It's actually been kind of interesting. So for those of you that are watching, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad you're there. I hope that most of you who are watching are the church family because it is actually really strange not being able to hang out with you on Sunday. But uh, we're going to do this as a broadcast, and we're going to get better at doing this along with um, other forms of media communication. So thanks for being here today, and I appreciate uh, your investment in this church. Some things I want to say to you that I think need to be said before we actually get to the message. Uh, I, I know that every one of us has been heavily focusing on uh, what the news has to say about the medical crisis and the uh, financial problem that's occurring right now. Um, this isn't the first time in history that this has happened in the world. Um, probably won't be the last unless Jesus comes back. But I, I just want to encourage you to um, go to the right source of information. Go to facts, not watching the news so much because... Whichever side of the news you like to watch, which is everybody talks about CNN and Fox and all this, look, they're going to give you their twist and their bend. All you really want to deal with are the facts. And quite frankly, I would only be concerned about the facts that are going to affect you personally. So I've got two places you can go to look for your information. You can go to www.cdc. Dot gov, and then you can go to a location called Health Senior Services, and that would be healthmo.gov. And that will tell you what you need to know on how to deal with this. It will give you the information of how many people are getting sick in your area. Um, you can find out what the governor is saying, all of that. But all that extra stuff you're getting in the news is creating anxiety for you because they have to make money selling, and they're going to sell it to you in such a way that it's going to keep your attention by motivating you with tension and fear and all that other stuff. So choose wisely where you get your truth from. And uh, having said that, being that this is a church, we're going to discuss today God's truth in reference to all of this stuff. And hopefully it'll do one of two things. It'll eat, Well, two things. It'll either motivate you to become more obedient and more concerned about your walk with God, or it will comfort you to know what you're going to know now. So my hope is, is that it will do both, that you will, you will see that you need to become more serious about your walk, and then the other side of the coin is, is that you also need to let the peace of God just kind of wash over you and give you a confidence that you may not have right now because you've been watching the news and this has never happened to you before in your life. Uh, if you're my age, it hasn't. Uh, people that are in their 80s had to deal with polio and other things, and their parents had to deal with the Great Depression. So, you know, for most of us, this is a brand new thing. So uh, the other thing I need to say is, and I hate doing this, but I need to say it, um, if you are financially stable during this time, um, then it would be wonderful if you saw um, or had the motivation to just keep supporting the ministry financially but not just supporting the ministry here financially, but seeing and looking for people in your neighborhood. If you have the ability, help them out also. You can do it through canned food items. Uh, of course, getting toilet paper is un almost impossible, but at least find ways to help other people if you can. But most definitely, if you're a member of this church, don't forget that we still have to pay the rent, the electricity, and everything and keep things going. And I, I know that I really don't need to say that to anybody at this church. I know you all understand that very well. I want to say this, though, on top of that. Those of you that are financially strapped, those of you that have lost your jobs, those of you who can't produce enough income from yourselves, do not feel guilty about that. Don't, let, don't feel like you're not doing your part. The way you do your part now, and this is wonderful that God does this, is you now have the opportunity, because you've lost resources, you have the opportunity to diligently pray for the people in your church, your community, the world, your president, the, you know, the medical people that are working out there 
you know, but you have the ability to spend a lot of time just praying. That is a great investment. In a lot of cases, in my opinion, that is more valuable than monetary because it is God who is our provider. And by going to him and asking him to provide is going to work. It's the best thing you could do. So I don't want you to feel uh, bad about not being able to help. I appreciate any prayer that happens here, and I mean that. Having said that, we need to pray before we start because we're going to get into a pretty interesting subject, I think. So let's pray. Um, Lord, from the get-go, I want to say I know you're sovereign. I want to say that I know you have this. I know that this is not a shock to you, that this is not, this is not a thing that's out of control for you. I know you have a plan. You've told us you have a plan. I know that you know how to move through any circumstances. You've demonstrated that to us through all of history. I also know, Lord, that your intention is to teach us a truth here, that it's not wasted, that there's something here. But more than anything, I know that everybody listening, we pray for the restoration of our societies globally. We pray that those that are losing people, Lord, that they would come to know you through it. And if they don't know you, that they would remember that you do love them and that you are very much involved in their lives and that there's something here greater than just a virus or economic issues. There's something greater here. So Lord, I pray that today you would speak and that all of us who are listening would hear what you have to say and that it would establish itself in our lives and that we would live out our faith in great wisdom. So I ask this according to your will. Amen. All right. We're going to be in Proverbs chapter 1. The name of this sermon is The Need for Prudence. And I'll eventually explain that word to us. But right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read to you Proverbs 1. 2 through 7, or chapter 1, 2 through 7, and then we're going to kind of break it down a little bit, and then we're going to go look at other verses also, but this is a good place to start. The Proverbs were written predominantly by, or mostly I think by King Solomon, there's a number of people that wrote them, but it's all about wisdom, it's all about uh, principles in essence of how to live your life. We're going to go and look at the Psalms also, which was written over a thousand year period, meaning different writers over a thousand years had psalms that are in there. It's not all David that wrote the psalms. You've got more than that. You've got a multitude. So you're going to see like a thousand years of people's comments and statements about God and his character. It's really kind of neat when you read the psalms. As I said last week, um, one of the best things my father ever did was tell us to read a one proverb chapter, Proverbs every day which there's 31 Proverbs, there's usually 31 days in every month, and to read a psalm and just keep working through the psalms to where you do it. It it is the best counsel I've ever got. Uh, The reason for it is, is it does give you a sense of peace. It will also convict you, but its, it's, its advantage is it helps you see or feel that you're looking in the right direction or that you're responding in the right way as you learn from the Proverbs. So let me start with Proverbs 1, and we'll do verse 2 through 7. To know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing and in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth, Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Don't miss verse 7. We're going to come back to that because that is the catalyst to everything. I don't care who says otherwise. If you are a Christian, you know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom. 
So we'll look at that and we'll break that down. But as we go here, I want to show you what's in this text right here, right now. Number one, your the discussion here is, you know, it's to know, and this is all in reference to wisdom. So to know, to understand, to receive, and receive simply means to be teachable. That's the one thing that I find is the problem in most people's lives. They hear, they listen, they understand. But they don't let it apply. They don't let it actually teach them. Because if they're being taught by something, then it develops a change in movement. So you can hear it and know it, but you haven't been taught unless it creates a change in movement. So you have to receive it. And then you have the other one, which is to give. Which, to give prudence, is what we're going to look at. Now I want to tell you what prudence means. Because it's an important word. Prudence or a prudent person is a person that um, has wisdom. They, are, uh, they use good judgment, uh, common sense. They take, uh, they take care to make decisions uh, with a lot of thought behind it, not just an action. Um, it would be a good way to say it would be level-headed or cool-headed. They... Um, they will make sure that as they're thinking or dealing with trials or, or problems or situations of change, to be cool-headed about it and make a decision that is got a flow to it instead of just reaction. So prudence is an important part of life. Now, you are seeing right now around the world people are not being cool-headed. They are not taking the time to reason. They are panicking. They are speculating, they are overreacting, and it's created a crisis that didn't need to exist if they would have taken the counsel of God. And that's the thing I want you to catch. The things that God tells us to do are not just little passive statements that he's making. They are facts. They are facts. It's the reason why he tells us not to be selfish. I said this, I think, last week. Selfishness creates what's just happened with people raiding the stores. If you were thinking of other people more highly than yourselves, then we would actually be working together as a unit to take care of each other. Now, there are going to be groups and clusters of people that are going to try and do that and use prudence in their decision-making process. There's going to even be people in our government who are trying to use wisdom and cool-headedness to try and solve this problem. But you also have other people that are selfishly using the situation for personal gain. You have people using it to progress their position in society over other people. Those people are hurting us. They're not helping us. They're not helping us. We want to be the type of people that are cool-headed, that we have prudence, that we have wisdom we operate from, and we logically work our way through this trauma or this crisis. Now, having said that, I know that there's going to be a lot of people that right now, because they're financially strapped, they're hurting, they've lost their job, um, somebody may even be sick that they know. I get it. It's really, really, really hard to have a cool head and not panic in those moments. I get it. But do your best. Do your best to take your time to think. I have to admit, my nature is to not be cool-headed. My nature is actually to respond intensely in crisis. As a matter of fact, my nature is to get very angry when things aren't right. And I have to work on this. So it's not me standing up here saying to you, oh, I've got this mastered. I wished I did. I think one of the reasons why I'm drawn to this text so often in my life is I need to be reminded that I have to be a man of wisdom, not a man of just overreacting and emotional, out of control. I have to be a person that disciplines himself to go to the Word of God and let it instruct me on how to navigate what's going on in life. You know, that's me. I, I always go here uh, to the Proverbs and to the Psalms whenever things bad happen in my life. So here we are. It's a global crisis, and I'm going to go right back here, and I suggest that everybody else do it. 
So prudence implies a cool head. It is the ability to use reason. I said this last week, reason is everything. You have to be a person that realizes that in all situations you have to think. You cannot just react unless it's on a battlefield, I guess. I don't know. But you've got to think. You can't, you can't just be emotionally erratic and afraid. You have to go, okay, I have moved into a situation that is going to hurt me in some way. Let's say I'm not going to have enough food or money or whatever. How should I get through this? Instead of going, oh, no, it's all over, it's lost, you start reasoning, okay, here's what we're going to do. So, having said that, I want to go to verse 7, and that's where we're going to focus a little bit more here. Um, this is highly misunderstood by a lot of people, what it is to fear God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. A foolish person thinks they don't need to learn anything. A foolish person will not allow the Word of God to instruct them in how to live their life. A foolish person will literally try to tell everyone else their view of how things should be and ignore God's wisdom that He's given us. And listen, I'm telling you, God has proven that the Word of God, His words, are wisdom, they are life, they are truth, and if you follow them, your life is going to be far much better off than if you try to change what he has said. And you are seeing right now on your planet an example of what happens to people when they reject the wisdom of God and think that their opinion can supersede his wisdom. It will not work. It cannot work. It's the reason why things are happening in the negative with some people where you've got people doing all this hoarding. You have people actually getting into fights over toilet paper. Think about it. So the fear of the Lord, what is that? That's what you have to come to understand. And it's a great... I, I, wish, I wish I was better at Hebrew and Greek and all the language, but this would be Hebrew. But... It's, the word itself is a very strong word. Now, here's what it is, and you wouldn't think of this. It's affectionate, deep respect. So it's not, oh, I'm scared, even though God, if he has to, can be scary. One of the neat things about God is he shows us that when Jesus came, and those of you that know your Bible well, when Jesus rode the donkey into the city, he was riding that donkey because he was a king of peace. Because if you were a king of peace, you rode a donkey. And he still is a king of peace. But when you read the book of Revelation, he comes back on a horse. And anybody in that culture at that time knows that when a king rides a horse, that is a king of war. And you should be afraid. So there's no question that God being who he is, there is a factor to him that is a scariness about him. But that isn't what your God wants you to see. And you see that in the way he deals with Moses. And that's a sermon for another day. His motive is not for you to fear him because he is so powerful. His motive for you is to effectually have great reverence for him because his love for you is so deep. That's the fear of the Lord. It's, it is this humbly accepting God as your Father, it is you humbly accepting God as your Savior. And when I say Savior, you need to understand that when God created everything and created you and put you in here, His intention was to be the only provider of every single thing you need. So you have to understand that you affectionately fear Him with deep reverence as your Father, and you reverent, with that reverence that you have for Him, you accept His will and His sovereignty. That's the area we tend to have the most problem. Accepting the fact that His will, for instance, is always good, is always righteous, and is always done in love. Now that's hard for people to understand, because His motive is to communicate to the whole world the truth. And if that means he has to hurt you, or allow something bad to happen to get your attention to where you go back to him and let him be your provider, then so be it. The fear of the Lord. 
It's an understanding, and it's a strong statement of understanding who He is. Most people do not know God as they should know Him, as He has revealed Himself. Most people see God the way they want to see Him. So they either see Him as a tyrant, or they see Him as somebody that is never just, everything's okay and honky-dory. He is neither. He is neither. He is balanced and solid in being who He is, and His will is the will that we need to be following, not our own. I mean, I can tell you right now, the problem that you're seeing on your planet, this financial pandemic, quite frankly, is not the problem. It is the byproduct of the problem. And the problem really is a spiritual moral issue that is creating this problem. And if you want me to explain how that works, I can. We can walk through and see how we ended up at this point. And it has everything to do with the rejection of the Word of God and not fearing Him as Lord. Everything. This is just a byproduct. And it won't be the last time probably, like I said earlier. The fear of God is an understanding you need to submit to His will. Do not miss that. And I know people that hear that and think of that as a negative statement. That is not negative. Submitting to somebody's will who has only one intention, and that is to do what is good and right, is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Unless you want to rebel. Unless you want to have an attitude of disrespect unless you just basically want to be God yourself, then you don't like that idea. And you will resist His will because you don't recognize it as good. You have bought the lie that Satan's put out and that God is bad. And it's not so. The fear of the Lord is a good thing, not a negative thing. And I know people that try to use that word fear there to scare people, to control people, to manipulate people. Listen, God is the only one you need to follow, period. You don't follow anything else. You follow the Lord's instruction. And there's going to be a lot of people out there that are going to try and talk to you as if they are speaking on behalf of God. Check them on it and make sure they are. Because a lot of times they're just doing it because they like feeling good about themselves and they like to feel like they're more righteous than you. Don't buy into that game. Your Father loves you and His desire is for you to respond to Him because you accept His affection. There, I've said enough on that. You rely on God's Word. The opposite of relying on God's Word does this. Take me to Proverbs 14, 18. Please. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. Simple-minded people. They don't take the time to use wisdom or knowledge. They inherit folly, but the prudent, again, there's that word, are crowned with knowledge. Take me to the next Proverbs 14, 15. Please. The simple believes everything, but the prudent gives thought to his steps. I love that statement. I can't tell you how many people go read the internet and they believe everything that's on there. Simple-minded people believe all of the fantasy, it's aliens, it's this, it's that. It's that. Listen, it may be. But you've got to think in terms of being prudent in your thought life. What are the facts? What are the facts that are solidly and clearly defined and shown? And you stay there. You're safe there. Take me to Proverbs 13, 16. In everything, the prudent acts with knowledge. But a fool flaunts his folly. We, I've done this. I don't know about anybody else. I've done this you'll actually spew your stupidity. <laughs> and sometimes it's fun. It's just fun to do. But a person who's prudent acts with knowledge. They make sure that what they're saying is really right. You're better off not saying it if it's not. What's the next one I got, Alan? Proverbs 18.13. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. I like that one too. I like all of these. My favorite one though is this one, Proverbs 18.2. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. I love that. They don't take any pleasure in understanding. They just want to view their... You, hey, I got a great opinion for you. Here it is. Listen, 
I don't care who it is. I don't care how powerful they are. I don't care how much money they have. I don't care what their title is. You challenge what they say to make sure that what they're saying to you is the truth. You just don't. You just don't sit there and go, okay. I, opinions don't matter much, really. And I've got a lot of opinions, believe me. God tells us to be wise and seek Him. That's something you have to remember. The wisest thing I ever did in my life is realizing that I needed to know what God knew. So I sought Him diligently, because if you ask anybody that knew me before I got serious about my faith, I was an arrogant jerk. But as I started moving in the direction of seeking God's wisdom, God's view on things, feeding it into my head daily. And I've got some people that come here at the church now that are doing that, and I'm loving it because I know the ride they're on. They're, they're on a ride, and it's a thrill to just see more and more truth and more and more God after living years of being just somebody who had their opinion. Now, it's wonderful when you start learning and living out the Word of God. It, I can't, you'll never know what I'm talking about until you start doing it. I want to show you something now that's going to be intense. Leviticus 26, 14, 21. God gave the people, the Hebrews, salvation. He freed them, and then He gives them this warning. And this is convicting. Now, this happened with the Jewish people, but it has application to us too in a way. God's saying to them, but if you will not listen to me after he saved them, if you will not listen to me and will not do all these commandments, if you spurn my statutes and if your soul abhors my rules so that you will not do all my commandments but break my covenant, then I will do this to you. I will visit you with panic, with wasting disease and fever that consumes the eyes and makes the heart ache, and you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. I will set my face against you, and you shall be struck down before your enemies. Those who hate you shall rule over you, and you shall flee when none pursue you. And if in spite of this you will not listen to me, then I will discipline you again sevenfold for your sins." And I will break the pride of your power. Let me say it again. And I will break the pride of your power. Your money won't sustain you. Whoops, I threw that in there. And I will make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze. And your strength shall be spent in vain. For your land shall not yield its increase. And the trees of the land shall not yield their fruit. Then if you walk contrary to me and will not listen to me, I will continue striking you. Sevenfold for your sins. What do you think? Those of you that are listening, hard stuff. This happened to Israel. Study your history. Why wouldn't he do it to us? To us? I mean, I don't read any more into it than what I'm saying. I'm just simply saying, there is no question everyone on this planet, even non-believers, knows something's wrong. They look at our planet and they say, we're doing things wrong. Something's wrong. Why wouldn't God respond intensely to what we're doing to His planet and to each other? You would. You would. But I don't want, I, I, I don't want to leave you with that. I want you to understand that when I said you fear the Lord, it's true. And there's the part that is scary. That's the part that's scary. I'm not, I'm not trying to tack anything on to anything that's happening other than what I said earlier. We are in the situation we are in as a globe because we chose long ago to reject the truth that God gave us and how to live. Now, you all know that if you're a believer. And if you want to try and fight and deny that and say, no, no, that's not loving, that's not kind, I'm sorry, you're not recognizing who God is. You're not understanding that sometimes, sometimes pain is healing in the sense that it brings a person to life. And I've mentioned it before, when you go get surgery, things like that, it, it hurts, you don't like it, but it's going to restore you to being who you should be. Welcome to life. That's it. But let me give you this. And I want you to stop and breathe for a minute. And now I want to let, 
and you need to get in this habit, listen to God's heart here. Listen to the thousands of years I told you about where people wrote in the Psalms and they, they were all pulled together into the Psalms and statements that are made by people. So let's go to the Psalms and I want to show you what this does. And I hope it does it for you like it does me. But you look at Psalms and take me there, Alan. The Lord redeems the life of His servants. None of those who take refuge in Him will be condemned. Now, just think for a minute. As a believer, what are you supposed to do? Look at it. The Lord redeems the life of His servants. None of those who take refuge in Him will be condemned. Give me the next one, Alan. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, and then Selah, which is like a so be it kind of thing. Next. Because he holds fast to me in love. Hear it. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. Who's he speaking about? You. Should be you. Because he holds fast, because Dan Reed holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. Because he, whoever your name is, whatever your name is, think about it. So look at this. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. You love God. You accept the love of God. That's what he does. Men have said it all through history. I am now standing here as just a simple man telling you it is the truth. Even if he slay me, it's the truth. Even if he takes my wealth, it's the truth. Next. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. Who provides everything for you? Listen, watch. He said I could do that, and that's why I was able to do that. I just breathed. My heart just beat because he said it would. He's the one that controls. He even knows which bugs are dying and aren't dying and controls them. So, sorry if you don't believe that. uh, Don't bother listening to me. But for those of you that claim to be God's children, those of you that believe and say you believe the Word of God, it's true. Cast your burden on the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. He's telling you He's got you. Doesn't mean you're going to have all your money, your nice house. Doesn't mean that the United States isn't going to have issues. Doesn't mean that you're not going to get sick. All of that is a lie in the prosperity teaching world. It's a lie. This is far deeper than we let it go. We need to let this Word of God seek in and recognize that we are kingdom people. We are kingdom people. And God's will is the will that needs to be done. Don't try and read any more into that because you don't know. You only know what He tells you. I don't know what tomorrow holds for me. How do I know that? You read James, he says, don't boast about what you're doing tomorrow. Cast your burden on the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Next. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them that those who love your name may exalt in you. Listen, when crisis comes and trauma comes and when you're scared and you're afraid and you're losing out on things, you may not be able to pay your bills, all of that. Listen, you grab hold of your dad's leg and you hang on and you hang on tight. He'll take you through it. I've been there, done that. Most of the time when you don't get through a crisis, um, a lot of times it has to do with the decisions you made that were decisions that were not acts of faith, but acts of you thinking you had the power. Now, don't read too much in that either. There is a point where you were appointed to die. There is a point where I'm appointed to die. He told us there would be trials and tribulations on this planet. He told us that we would deal with this stuff. He never said it would be any other way. We are at that point. When you're at this point where you're hurting like we're hurting, 
You grab hold of God and you let everything He says just cover you. You read it, you claim it, you live it. That's the secret to all of this. For you bless the righteous, O Lord, you cover him with favor as with a shield. That should calm you as you read the Psalms. You're not the only one out there that is feeling the pressure of this. And believe me, if you go look at things like, and I'm not going to beat this horse long, but if you go look at what happened in 1918 when influenza broke out and World War I was going on, I mean, I've got sheet music all over my house that tells the story of the hearts of people from that time period. It was hard. It was hard. Most of our doctors were in Europe at the time when the influenza outbreak happened here in the United States. So you're here, why? Because somebody in your family survived that. Those people that survived 1918 influenza, they were here because their family survived the plague. And we can go all through history. This stuff happens. The problem is, is in the United States and other places, not all over the world, but a lot of places, but here especially, we're Americans. Nothing should happen to us. That's not true. That's a false dichotomy. It's, it's not true. Things do happen. And just because we're Americans doesn't mean that we're going to be provided for or immune to some of the things that happen in the world. Now, we have to admit, we are blessed people because medically what we have now versus what they had there in that time is day and night. I mean, we are blessed, and the abundance that we have available to us is immense. So you know, even though we're in a crisis, we are still blessed people. <clears throat> I want to go to Matthew 6, and I know that I'm taking time, but... You know, we're going to do it. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Everybody's heard this. Everybody reads that and goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That word anxious means excessive concern. Don't be anxious about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. Well, we already blew that one out of the water because everybody was anxious about their life. They panicked. They went and bought all the food and everything. Even the water was gone. I went into the stores. And then, of course, went to the extra extreme, toilet paper. But they don't mention that in this text. What will you eat or what will you drink, nor about your body, what you will put on? Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? More than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. Now, I, I did this the other day. I sat on my back porch and I listened. They are oblivious to everything going on right now. They were flying around, eating bugs, eating little seeds off the ground, anything they can, doing their thing. And here I was sitting on the porch like a human being, thinking about everything that could go wrong, and they're, they're oblivious. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? That is not a... a a weak statement there. If God cares about all of the other things going on on this planet, how much more does He care about you? It's immense. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his life? Now think about this. I thought this was great. You worrying doesn't add any more time onto your life as a matter of fact, they've proven that when you worry, you're actually taking time off your life. Go read medical science. You're actually killing yourself when you're anxious and worrying, whereas if you're not, you're actually doing better. It's, you know, but worry, it's not going to do anything for you. That's why prudence is important, because if you're reasoning and thinking instead of worrying and being anxious, your odds of getting through a crisis are far greater far greater, and you'll live longer. Um, and why are you anxious about clothing? Meaning, why are you worried about your material things? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Again, he's telling you, you're forgetting that God is sovereign and everything is under his control. That's really what that's, it's that simple. 
Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, that means they used to burn it back then. That has nothing to do with hell. People have tried to tell me that. It just doesn't. It's simply, back then they used to throw that rotten old grass away. It simply is telling you, you're going to die someday in essence. It, you're, you're here tomorrow, you're gone. It, it's, you're just a breath. And there's all kinds of other scriptures that say that. The problem is we don't want to believe that. I, I'm 56. I know that I'm getting old. I'm feeling it now. It's not long. I will be gone. I'm not saying I'm going to die tomorrow or anything, but I'm not going to live too long after this. I mean, what? Who wants to live to be 120 or 112? But that's not a lot of years, really. Will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? That's what you need to catch. Where's your faith? Who do you believe in? What do you believe in? Whose words do you believe? Do you believe what the media tells you? Do you believe the opinion of people talking around you? Or do you believe the word of God? Do you believe, do you put your faith in your wealth? Or your education? Or your president? Or the medical community? Even though they matter and it's all important, don't misunderstand me, it all matters. Or do you put your faith in God that He is the one who sustains all life? Listen, all He has to do is flip the switch and this is done. I mean, and we can't do anything about it. I w there's a song Sting did and it had a great line in it. It was, uh, how fragile we are. On and on the rain keeps falling like tears from a star, like tears from a star. Making a reference, how fragile. Well, we don't realize how fragile we are. We don't realize that the strength that we think we have is really not that strong. And I find it interesting that a little microscopic bug is proving that our money and our education and our strength can't stop it. And this one isn't even a, as bad as some of the other ones that exist. A little microscopic organism can take out millions of people. We're not what we think we are. We're excessively fragile. And we need something greater than ourselves to sustain us. Yet, I know, like everybody else knows, pretty much, the world's never going to believe that we need God. Christians should, though. Therefore, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Please do that. That's what this is all about. Seek His kingdom. That's what you are, your kingdom people. Look at this. And all these things will be added to you. You'll be taken care of. Even if you die, you're still taken care of. Because He's taken you to where He is, and you'll never have to deal with any of this ever again if you believe the Word of God. If you don't, then you'll think that this is all there is, and you're going to be afraid and anxious, and you're going to run around and violate people, and you're going to be selfish and self-centered. You want to live with that kind of mindset like the world does? Hence the word Gentiles, do it. Me, I'm living for something greater than myself and greater than this planet. And that's how you need to think. Force yourself to go in the direction of godly wisdom and you will find a sense of peace that you cannot have as long as you think this is the answer. This place is not the answer. <clears throat> You're not supposed to be anxious about tomorrow for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Meaning you have no control really as much as you think you do. It's going to come. Guess what? Tomorrow you're going to go turn your news on and the news is still going to be the same thing. And if they get the virus to go away and they fix the economy, they'll find something else to talk about that's broken and not working right. Stop listening to the world. Start listening to God. I can't beat it enough. I'm trying. Don't be anxious. Having said all that, and I'm going to wrap up now, I want to give you this one last verse, and I really like this one. And here's your homework. Go study this verse and really try and draw out of it what it actually means. Go to 2 Corinthians for me, please. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight, slight momentary affliction 
is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comprehension. I know that to be true. Every Christian should know that to be true. As we look not to the things that are seen, see that's the problem, but to the things that are unseen, spiritual. For the things that are seen are transient, meaning they're moving on. They, they move on. But the things that are unseen are eternal, permanent. Permanent. You either believe God or you don't. I know it's hard right now. Your parents got through the depression. Your great grandparents got through the depression. People in your family, your ancestors got through the flus, the lack of penicillin, polio, wars. You exist because they got through it. This is life. It's never going to be different. But your spiritual condition can be eternal and permanent. Your hope can be in something that actually has the ability to produce what you hope for. This world will never give you that kind of hope that Christ gives you. And God is to be respected and revered. And when a society chooses not to, this is what happens. As people that are a church, as people that have families, you can choose, like it says, choose this day whom you will serve. That's the way we need to think. You can buy all the toilet paper in the world. If God doesn't want you alive, that toilet paper is not going to do anything for you. It's just not going to do it. And you'll never make enough medicines. Sorry. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Let's pray ourselves out. Lord, I pray that what was said today was what you wanted said. Lord, I pray that you would teach people to seek you for comfort and peace. But at the same time, I pray that your word of God, if it's necessary, brings people to repentance so they can enter into your peace, as the scripture says. Lord, teach us, me included, Teach us to be people that seek your comfort and your provision. Teach us to be a people that become wise and prudent in our thinking and our actions. I pray that you would seal up and close off Satan and his destructive thought patterns from us and that we would learn to live according to your will and not any other will. I pray for those that are lost that don't know you. I pray for those that are scared right now because they don't know you. I pray, Lord, that you would give them the ability to find you and enter in. I pray that you give us opportunities to throw the seeds into the storm with the intention of seeing salvation occur, seeing you work in the lives of other people that need you. Lord, I pray in the midst of this storm that we shine as believers that we give people a sense of there's something out there greater than this. So I don't know how else to say it, Lord, but I pray your will would be done in all these things. Amen. Thanks.